Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Kathleen Newman from Maine Historical Society. Uh, it is September 24th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us for this program, A History of Maine Railroads uh, with Bill Kenny. Uh, Bill's going to be talking to us tonight about uh, railroads in Maine and about his new book, A History of Maine Railroads. Uh, just give me one moment. I want to introduce our speaker properly. So Bill Kenny uh, is a former career U.S. Air Force officer and Gulf War veteran, uh, and he developed a lifelong interest in trains uh, after his first ride on one when he was 11. In his military service, he implemented intensive planning and coordination of rail and ship movements of military equipment from the United States and Europe for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and he oversaw railroad operations at Eagleton, Bill, you can correct me if I'm mispronouncing this, uh, at Eagleton Air Force Base in Alaska and Loring Air Force Base in Northern Maine. Hi, Elson Air Force Base. Thank you. You're welcome. Later, he, he was involved in global, a global logistics career that planned and coordinated the movement of large equipment around the world by rail and shipping for major industrial companies. And his many experiences have informed his education, love of railroads, and their history. And B Bill, is this your first book, uh, History of Maine Railroads? Yes, it is. All right, so thank you so much for joining us. And he's gonna share with us uh, the story of railroads in Maine and tell us more about his book this evening. Uh, so take it away, Bill. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, first of all, I start this slide this is a picture of, of, up at the uh, Waterville, Wiscasset, and Farmington Railway Museum up in Alder near Wiscasset. And I show this picture because it shows a picture of a car barn that they use, which is your maintenance facilities for the railroads. That engine you see there was the last uh, short, uh, narrow gauge steam engine that was built by the Portland Company in Portland, Maine. Uh, and that green little engine you see on the right is called a yard goat, which is just a small engine that allows them to move the, the cars around and put them in the barn, take them out of the barn and things like that. So that's why I show this slide. There's a lot of history right in this one slide and that's a wonderful place to visit. When I talk about this, this is not a book about individual trains. It's a book about the economic engine of trains, the railroads themselves, who benefit from them, what's in it for me. So when you look at that, who benefits? Well, you have some people that benefits, the mill owners benefited because we had mills that were being built uh, all across the state and they needed the, the power. And they had the power because they owned the uh, dams and the electricity. So they had to find a way to use this electricity and they, and they used it for that. Uh, they also, the, the owners, they were the owners of the electric companies. The Bangor, for example, the, the power company that had existed now that used to be Bangor Hydro is the same company that was built way back. Uh, John Graham was the, was the GE person in Bangor that went up there and started it. You'll read about him. Another name in there are the key players is George Manfield. Now, George Manfield is an interesting person because he went to Wales and saw them a two-foot railroad. Now, that's about half the size of your normal railroad, which are four feet, eight inches. These are only one foot 11 and 5 eighths inches apart, the rails. So why did they build those? Well, they built those for a couple of reasons. First of all, they couldn't get the money to build bigger ones because they weren't allowed to uh, issue bonds to raise money. So it was up to the individual mill owners, the sawmill owners and, and the people that had to move lime and slate and iron ore had to build their own railroads. Well, you're not gonna build a huge four lane highway when you only need a small one lane highway. So they built these short two foot railroads that serve their purposes. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Another key player in there was a man named John Poor, and that was significant because John Poor uh, started the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railway. Now, why is that important? Well, if you go to Portland and you go down to the foot of India Street, you'll see a brick building on the corner that's now a Graham Savings Bank branch, and you look over the door and it says Grand Trunks Railroad and Steamship Company. We had steamships that were landing in Portland and they had to have a place to go. So right up the road, they built the Grand Trunk uh, Station, which was actually a busier station and, and uh, more beautiful station than Union Station that a lot of us know about. So 
he had to find a way to to increase the business and, and use the people coming off the ships and also to transport products in and out of Portland. Well, at the same time, the city of Montreal and Quebec uh, were having a problem shipping their goods because the St. Lawrence Seaway froze up every year. So he raced up there. He got permission from the state and actually got a charter for the railroad in his hand. And he raced up there and beat some people that were coming from Boston all the way to Montreal to say, you should hook up with us and let us build a railroad and we can hook up Montreal to Portland, Maine, and you can ship all the products in and out of Portland and all the passengers in and out of Portland. And that lasted until they have ice cutters and they were able to clear the St. Lawrence and was no longer beneficial. But that was significant at the time. Uh, they, he went up there and he proved that Boston was actually further away than, 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 than Portland. And the harbor in Portland didn't freeze over as often as the harbor in Boston. So they got the business and they did that. So that's kind of a key person to read about in the book. The other thing are there are two governors that were very key players. The first governor was Joshua Chamberlain. Now we're all known for his Civil War escapades, but what a lot of people don't know about was there was a railroad terminal station in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All the northern supplies that were going to support the Union troops going south had to go through Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. General Lee's army, General Lee's army itself, not a subordinate army, went up there to try to take over that railroad uh, terminal and interchange to interrupt the war. Now, Joshua Chamberlain held that off, and if he didn't fight back uh, Lee's army, we might have had a different outcome of the war. So he, that was a very significant thing. Later on, when he became governor of Maine, he uh, got involved and, and did two things. First of all, he went to the legislature and he got approval to get, get public bonding for railroads. So all of, a, all of a sudden you could now get public funding and build railroads where before it was up to the individual owners to, to do this. Uh, he also invited President Grant, his former boss, to come up and dedicate the Bangor and Piscataquis Railroad that went from Bangor to Old Town and eventually over to Milford. Uh, so that was pretty significant as well. The second governor I want to mention is John Baldacci, a recent governor. When he was in the legislature in Congress, when he was in Congress, he was on the Transportation Committee and he was on the Railroad Subcommittee. So the reason you have Amtrak in Maine now is because of John Baldacci. But more significantly, the Maine Central and, and uh, Quebec Railroad were going to tear up all the rail tracks in Aroostook County. They said, we don't need them anymore. We're losing money. We're going to tear them up. Working with Olympia Snow in the Senate and with the Obama administration, he was able to get a grant, a federal grant, to buy those railroad lines so they didn't tear them up. And thank goodness he did that because today, uh, Canadian Pacific has taken over the central Maine and Quebec, and we now have a class one railroad coming all the way through Maine again, which is significant. So that's uh, the important thing here is to remember that the, the way we had railroads was to get the right stuff to the right place at the right time for the right price. Now, a lot of people want to ask where the first railroad was in Maine. They talk about the Bangor and Piscataquis Railroad, and that's sort of true. They were the first passenger railroad. But the first railroad started down east in the Callis and Bering Railroad. And that was basically significant because they had a man named William Vance up there who owned a bunch of sawmills in New Brunswick and across the river north of Woodland or Baileyville. And he had to find a way to get the lumber from his mills to the port of Callis to ship around the world. So he built the railroad. Now the significance part of this is that railroad at first was hauled by horses. It was not even hauled by an engine. So they didn't pull it by an engine. Uh, so that's the first one. When I talked about that Bangor Piscataquis Railroad, I, I tried to put this in a book, but the, they said the picture wasn't of good enough quality so they couldn't get in there. But I think it's kind of significant that we had the President of the United States come up in 1871 and dedicate the Bangor and Piscataquis Railroad. Now, when you think about the railroads at that time, that first passenger railroad, I want you to think about stagecoaches. They weren't like the modern 
cars that we have now on the railroads, they were basically converted stagecoaches that were hooked together and being pulled by an engine. Uh, they didn't have any heat. Uh, they didn't even have, uh, the, they had to have a spotter standing on top of the car behind the engine to let the engineer know when he should stop and go and if there was any problems up ahead. So it was very rudimentary, but he at least got it started. So I think that is, that is relatively significant. Now I talked about the narrow gauge when I talked about Mansfield going to, to uh, Wales and seeing they didn't. Now what happened was he came back and he went to Bedford, Massachusetts. And he went to Bedford, Massachusetts and convinced them to build the Bedford and Bill Ricker Railroad to hook up with the Lowell and Boston Railroad line. But again, they didn't have a whole lot of money. So they said, we, you can use a narrow gauge. You don't have to build a great big railroad. So we did that. And the photo I have in here, that narrow gauge tracks that you see are on the Portland Eastern Promenade and the standard gauge tracks are the, the wider ones that you see throughout the state. So he came in and tried to do that. Well, it didn't work out too well and it went broke. So he took all that knowledge, moved to Farmington, Maine and opened what we now know as the Sandy River and Range the Lake Railroads. He took all the engines and the two footers up there. A couple of the cars went down to to the Cape Cod for the cranberry bugs and down in Carter, Massachusetts. So they had some of the small engines and cars down there as well. So that's kind of significant to know about the difference. Now, the type of locomotives that we had, you had a steam engine, which uh, ran into Maine until 1954. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We also have a diesel engine, which you now see that pulls the Amtrak and pulls the the Guilford Pan Am rail. And we also have electric trolleys that we'll talk about a little bit. That's mentioned in the book. Now I show this picture of the Bar Harbor Express. The reason I show this is that steam engine on the left is engine 470, which was the last full size steam engine to run in Maine. In 1954, they took its last trip up the Waterville and the Maine Central Railroad says, we don't need that anymore. So they said, Waterville, how would you like to have it? Well, Waterville took it, stuck it on a cement slab downtown and did nothing with it. And a couple of years ago, the Down East and Scenic Railroad bought it and they trucked it down to uh, Trenton down near Ellsworth and they're rehabbing it and they're gonna put it back into service. But that shows the, the steam engine. Now the Bob Express, a lot of people commuted from New York and, and other states in New England and that's how the business people came up here and got to Bar Harbor where they had their summer residence as they took the train up to Bangor. Then they took the Bar Harbor Express from up to Portland rather and took the Bar Harbor Express from Portland down to Bar Harbor. And it shows the diesel engines on the right. And that's the old North Station that you see, Union Station in Portland that's in that picture. Now the Grand Trunk Railroad, that's the one I talked about that Mansfield, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, George Graham got to get started. And that's the one that went all the way from Portland, Maine, all the way up to Montreal. And some of the people that are old enough can probably remember the grain elevators down in Portland that they just tore down a little while ago. And that's something to look at. The Grand Trunk also has a significant building still in existed up on Presumpscot Street. If you go to register your motor vehicles there on Presumpscot Street, that building was a Grand Trunk roundhouse where they had like the car barn that they had, it was a roundhouse where they stored all the cars. So again, the Grand Trunk Railroad connected Montreal to Portland and the Grand Trunk Waterfront included grain elevators, multiple piers and a depot that was absolutely beautiful. I was sorry to see them tear that down. I actually got to see that when I was young, my grandfather took me there to pick up a relative and it was beautiful. So you can see here that the Grand Trunk Railroad uh, came out of Portland and went up through Yarmouth and then it swung over towards Bethel and up through New Hampshire and on to Montreal. So that's where that one tracked. The Maine Central Railroad is kind of unique. The Maine, Maine Central Railroad didn't build any railroads. They took 30 or 35 smaller railroads, put them all together and built this network of railroads. Now, if you think of the uh, Grand Trunk, it goes uh, north and uh, northwest towards Quebec. And if you think of the main central, it basically goes straight up and east over towards uh, St. John, New Brunswick. So that's, that's how to look at that. And that is a significant railroad. The Bangor and Aroostook comes from Searsport and goes all the way up through Aroostook County. 
And the Bangor and Aristic Road is kind of an interesting one because that's a that's the combination of the Bangor and Piscataquis Railroad and the Katahdin Ironworks Railroad. Now that had a significance to me because I, I ran the railroad out of Loring Air Force Base and we used to get all our coal there was brought up by the Bangor and Aristic Railroad and we'd hook onto our their cars and take the coal into the base. But more significantly, when we had munitions, especially significant heavy munitions, well, we didn't let the Bangor and Aristic haul it. We took our own engines all the way down to Searsport, loaded the munitions and brought it up to Loring. Another thing that's very important about Searsport is that was the most busiest, that was the busiest port on the East Coast in the mid 1800s to the late 1800s. And a lot of stuff went out of Searsport. In uh, World War One, I'm sorry, in World War Two, more munitions were shipped out of Searsport Harbor, and it came in there by rail than in any other port in, in the entire United States. The Central Maine and Quebec Railroad that I talk about uh, was the one that the Central uh, Canadian Pacific rather just purchased, and you read about that in the afterword of the book. When I talk about the book, I start off saying there are no Class One railroads. Now, a Class One railroad is sim simply a significant railroad with lots of miles, and Maine didn't have any for a while. As a matter of fact, when uh, the Guilford Industries and the Mellon family bought Guilford and then turned it into Pan Am, they tried to break it up so that they could be smaller railroads and they didn't have to pay the same wages and fall under the same rules as a class one railroad. But now that the Canadian Pacific, which you read about in the afterwards in the book, I had to put it on afterwards because it was at the publisher when they bought it and transferred ownership in June of this year. So now you're seeing about four or five times the amount of freight going in and out of Maine that you did just six months ago. Now we talk about trolleys. Now trolleys is kind of an interesting thing. First of all, and there's an appendix in the book that lists them, there were 90 different communities in Maine that had trolleys. Think about that. 90 different communities in Maine had trolleys. Why did they have them? Well, that was a, a simple way to to use the electricity. Again, most of these trolleys were built by the people that owned the power companies in Bangor, Lewiston, and Portland. They had all this power and they said, what can we do? Only 15% of the people at that time had power in their homes. So just having a way to get around and having electric trolleys was, was a big deal. The longest trolley was the Lewiston Augusta Interurban, which was 152 miles long. The most popular one is the Portland Lewiston Interurban, which was only 40 miles long, 42 miles. But it was significant because that was the busiest one. Now think about this. This was, you now had a way to commute from Augusta, Lewiston, all the way into Portland to do your work. And that's, that's kind of significant. So suburbs were created as a result of this. And because they started bringing in the electric trolleys and all the power into the cities, more and more homes were getting, getting electricity. Now, we talk about the trolleys in the Portland Railroad. You had the Portland Railroad system that uh, was the completion of the Soccer Old Orchard Line. And it went all the way to Portland, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, Scarborough, Soccer, Old Orchard Beach, Westbrook, Gorham, South Wyndham, Falmouth, Cumberland, and Yarmouth. More than 500 people, including 133 motormen and 133 conductors were employed. The line owned a total of 217 passenger cars or trolleys. The Portland and Brunswick Railway also came out of Portland and that served trolley parks along the way. The Underwood Springs in Falmouth, or the Wildwood Casino Resort, which is in Cumberland, the Casco Castle in Freeport, and the Merrimeeting Casino Trolley Park in Brunswick. Now I want to pause here for just one second because think about this. The people that are living in your triple deckers in Portland had no air conditioning. Very few had power or electricity. So for about 15 cents, they could put their family on a trolley and go out to Riverton Park, for example, or go to one of the other trolley parks in Falmouth or, or, or Brunswick or, or wherever. And for the day, they could have an outing. So it was a way to get out of the the heat and humidity in the summer to be able to go use those things. It was very, very popular. Again, I talked about the Portland Lewiston Interurban, which was 40 miles long. 
and the Lewis and Augusta and Waterville Street Railway, which is 142 miles long. This is a picture they also wouldn't let me put in the book because of the quality. This is uh, Teddy Roosevelt, about a year after he was, he, this is when he was running as a third party candidate. And he's on the, the trolley, the narcissist in gray. And he's speaking to a crowd there. Now the narcissist is a very important uh, car. It's the only one left in existence from the trolley line, the Portland Lewis and Interurban. It's being restored by the main trolley museum down in Wells. And it's a significant restoration, and that's a beautiful thing that they were able to save this. Now, we I talked a little bit about going to the trolley parks. That was one of the premier attractions in the late 1900s, up for the first three decades of the 1900s. It was served by a, by a trolley that departed from Monument Square, and it went out there to the, to the Riverton Trolley Museum Park, which had a casino, an amphitheater, a dance hall, and even a petting zoo. So that was quite a treat for the families to be able to go out and, uh, and, and see something like that. Now I threw this in there because when we talk about the main central railroad, when you get to Bath, until they built the Carlton Bridge, until they built that Carlton Bridge in 1927, there was no way to get the train across the other side of Woolwich. So they had a train ferry now. It's not a very good picture, but if you look real close, you see on that ferry, there's a, a railroad engine on the ferry. They unhooked the railroad engine, put it on the ferry, took it to the other side, hooked it back up, and went up to places like Thomaston to get the lime and, and, and to be able to move that around the, the country. So I thought that was kind of significant that they actually had a, a heavy engine that was actually going on, on a ferry boat. This is uh, my website, historymain.com. It's pretty easy to remember. You can go on there and you can read a little bit about the upcoming book signings and talks that I have. It's winding down a little bit for this year, but there's a few left. You can also order the book on there and have it shipped to you uh, directly if you want, autographed copy. However, I prefer that you also go to the Maine Historical Society bookstore. Now, they have a few books left in stock. And if they happen to run out of books, you can uh, order, pre-order, and they'll ship them to you when they come in or call you and let you know when they're in. Or again, you can go to my website and get them from me. But again, we'd like to try to support the Maine Historical Society, so I prefer if you go to them first. That about, that about sums up the talk. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks so much, Bill. I do have a couple questions for you from some of our attendees. Um, and also, uh, I got some questions uh, by email earlier today in anticipation of the talk. Um, so, a uh, first question from Lloyd. Uh, it's, Lloyd says, it's my understanding that North Berwick was a major rail center for both railroads uh, between 1842 and 1889. And, um, I believe that there was an engine terminal and roadhouse in North Berwick that housed steam locomotives for Boston and Maine. Do you know anything about that? Yes, the, that they did have a station in North Berwick. And what happened is that was an offshoot or a tributary or whatever you want to call it, a small line that came off the Grand Trunk uh, that went out in that direction. And the Maine Central also connected with it to go there. So that, that was a significant thing. A lot of, a lot of, ore and stuff came out of the Berwick area, mining ore. So that was primarily what that was used for, but that is significant. I do talk about that in the book. Very good. Lloyd also asks, um, he says, it's very hard to find info on uh, the Grand Trunk Railroad that ran from Portland um, to St. John to Montreal. What was the purpose of the Grand Trunk uh, in coming into Portland? Okay, well, first of all, it didn't go to St. John. The main center went to St. John. The Grand Trunk was the one that went up and went to Montreal, went up and headed Northwest. And I, and that's what I talked about a little bit before in the talk is we had all these steamships that were coming in here. If you think of today's cruise ships that come into Portland, they had steamships coming in. The Cunard Line and the White Lines actually came into Portland. And those were how people got to come to the United States was by these clipper ships. They landed in Portland, so now they could go passengers, they could walk up the street, 
land at Portland, walk up the street a block in India Street to the to the to the station and get on the train and, and head up there. So that's kind of that's kind of significant. Uh, and again, the reason they did that was to be able to get people and goods because the St. Lawrence Seaway froze over in the wintertime until they had ice cutters. So that was the traffic. Now that's what's kind of important about that is because of that railroad, the first international agreement was written between the United States and another country. They wrote, a, they wrote an agreement with them to say, you don't have to pay any taxes or any duties on anything going back and forth on the railroad. The other thing that's important about the Grand Trunk, and I talk about it in the book, is think about Lewiston, Maine and the mills up there. The Libby's up there on the mills up there. And um, when they built the mills up there, and, and the other one up there was also the, uh, the Bates mills. The Bates and the Libby mills. Now the Bates owned the dam. So they had the electricity for the mills, which were built after the, the textile mills in Lowell. They were designed after those. So they were providing power to that. Now the problem they had is they built all these new mills. They had all these power, but you only had a couple thousand people living in Lewiston. So who's gonna work in the mills? So they sent recruiters on the Grand Trunk up to Montreal to say, and Montreal was having the workers up there were going through a recession. So they said, why don't you come down to, to Lewiston, work in the mills, earn a few bucks, you can go home on the weekends and when you have days off, or you can come down here and work for six months or a year and build up some money and go back home. And a lot of them did that. So many did that that they, they became known as the Ellis Island of Maine. And a lot of the people stayed in Lewiston. They have the French settlement that's still there. And you can go up in Lewiston now and the Grand Trunk Station still exists. Yeah, right next to the mills and you can see that. So that's kind of significant that the workers came down, the commuted basically to say, we can't make a living up here. There's no work. So we'll go down there and we'll come back and support our families that way. But again, the, the size of the population of Lewiston tripled in about five years because the people came down, the mills were pretty good jobs. So they just settled here. Neil asks, uh, do you know what the early cost was per mile to build the tracks? And did that include buying um, right of ways? Well, the, the short lines were built by the people that owned the mills and owned the mines. And uh, they did have to purchase some right of ways, but they also started what we know now as eminent domain and get the legislature to approve it. As a matter of fact, there's a neat neat side story. I grew up in Old Town, Maine, and my grandfather, who grew up in Orono, kept telling me about this place called Hogtown. And I said, I just, okay, it's called Hogtown. And I found out when I was doing this research that the, the mill there, the Vance Mills, uh, was going up there trying to go to the Bangor Piscataquis Railroad. We're trying to go out across this person's property, this woman's property. It was a pig farm. And she says, no, you can't do it. So they went to court and the court says, yes, you can do it. So what she did was every time a train would come along, she turned the hogs loose on the railroad tracks. So they have to stop and clear them off the tracks. And that's how I got the name Hogtown. So I think that's kind of <laughs> neat when you discover something in your past that, that relates to it. So. But the, the cost per mile uh, was significant because again, the mill owners had to buy it themselves. They couldn't go out and get bond issues. In today's dollars, it's, uh, not as significant as it was back then, but it was it was relatively significant. But it was still cheaper than trying to haul it by horses and, and, and pull the stuff out on on wagons and horses. The actual cost per mile related to today is probably about eight or ten thousand dollars in today's dollars per mile. I mean, it costs about a million dollars a mile to build a railroad track now. Jane asks, in terms of tonnage, what are the primary goods that are being carried on the freight lines in Maine today? The uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad, which is the largest railroad that comes down from Canada, will haul about three or 400 tons of uh, material a day. Uh, they'll have between uh, 400 and 600 cars on different trains that go in and out of Maine. And that's another thing that's important about one of them, John Balbacci, and he happened to be a lifelong friend of mine, which is how I got him to write the forward. And his dad owned a restaurant in Bangor, my dad owned a restaurant in Old Town, so we were the same, same circle. Uh, one of the things that's significant was 
he was trying to get a lot of the trucks off the road. Uh, the trucks were beating up the roads going north. So he said, if we can have more people in the, the farmers in Arista County haul by train again, it would be easier. Now, the problem with trains is they don't go door to door. They have to be offloaded. But now you have the piggybacks where the trucks go on the, the rail cars and, and you can move 100 freight cars pulling an engine 10 miles and it would take 2,000 trucks off the road. Think about that. Wow. That's that's significant, and uh, I just and now you're seeing that if you look at uh, when I talked about the Port of Sears port, there's also there were several ports that were in Portland. Of course, Portland was important, and again, Baldacci got the state to uh, open up the terminal there now, and you see those I'm skip containers that are down there from Iceland. He got it ready, and and Paul LePage was in office when it actually opened, but all the funding of the building was done under Baldacci and got the grant to do that. So now you're seeing a lot more freight being shipped around. And when I was up to Rumford one day, I saw an I'm Skip uh, car up there, a cargo unit on, on a train. And I said, what's that? And they said, that's going to Poland Springs. Oh, to pick up water? Yes, but what's in it now? And they said, plastic beads. They're, all the plastic beads were in there to build the bottles, to make the bottles to put the water in. So it's kind of a neat thing. So if you look at the, Pan Am Guilford Railroad today, you'll see a lot of those I'm skip containers moving in and out. So Sears Port is a significant, I mean, Portland's a significant port now. Sears Port is still significant, as is Eastport. Eastport is also a significant uh, port. Uh, there's a lot of oil and, and gas, that com petrified gas that comes in out of uh, into Eastport, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes in and out of there too. But the amount of product that are shipped out of the ports now has quadrupled in the last 10 years because the railroads have become more robust and you're starting to get things from Canada. So that's that's significant. And I go down to the to Portland and, and talk to the Imskip people now and it's amazing that they have several thousand containers a week going through there. So it's it's pretty significant going to Europe. Alan asks, what is the Grand Trunk Station in Lewiston being used for now? Nothing. It's closed up. But you can drive, I forget the name of the street, but it's if you take that street that's right by the mills. And it comes out, if you're going into Auburn and cross the bridge into Lewiston and take a right, there's a car wash named after a woman on the corner there. If you go down that street, it's right there on the right. And uh, there's a picture of that in, in the book as well. But that's uh, that's a, that's kind of neat. And that's where the people came from uh, from Montreal to come down to work in the mills. Neil says, um, I was under the impression that many Irish immigrants built the railroads in Maine. Is that true? There was a lot of Irish immigrants that built the railroads in Maine and there were Chinese immigrants that built the railroads in Maine. They used both. Yes, they were significant. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, you mentioned that icebreakers ended uh, the Grand Trunk's biggest business, uh, grain. Um, he says, I thought that all the grain business ended when Canadian railroads made it to Nova Scotia and that regarding the Portland Terminal Company, um, what were the principal sources of revenue for that railroad? For the Grand Trunk? Yes. The Grand Trunk, you had the passengers going back and forth and you had goods that were coming from Canada through Montreal down to Portland. But again, they had to do that because they couldn't ship anything out of Canada uh, in a cost-effective way in the wintertime because the St. Lawrence River was iced up. So when they started having ice cutters and, and they didn't need it anymore, uh, they also built a railroad that went from Quebec towards St. John uh, in the interim too. So a lot of the stuff started going being shipped out of St. John to Brunswick. Now, uh, Jeremy also asked, and I don't know if this is specifically about your book or, or just in general, but are there photos available of the Portland Terminal Company? Is there what available? Photos available. Yes, there are. You can uh, Google them or you can go to the Maine Historical Society. They have some there as well. Uh, the, the Portland Company was kind of significant because they built the uh, railroads, but they also built some military vehicles during World War II. They mm -hmm. tried to build a car or two. They did a, they did a lot of work. That was a significant uh, uh, machine shop, if you will. It was huge. 
and the uh, main narrow gauge was operating out of one of their buildings there and they got thrown out when the building got sold here a couple years ago. And they've got a grant now to build a new facility and we'll see how that goes. But, uh, uh, but that's another uh, narrow gauge that's worth uh, seeing. Now it's kind of neat because when we talk about that station for the Grand Trunk, the St. Lawrence and the um, Atlantic also came out of that same station. So you get down to the bottom of India Street uh, where the big boats come in now and the trains went there and they went across that swing bridge that you see out in the harbor by b and Beans. They went across there and that's how they got across. That, that was not, now the two footer goes out there for the main narrow gauge, but that was not a two foot railroad that went through there. It was a, a full gauge railroad, standard gauge railroad that went out of there. And again, the St. Lawrence and uh, Atlantic went up and hung a right and became part of the main central later and the grand trunk went up and on the left and went towards Lewiston. Wallace asks, uh, do you have any information about a railroad trestle over Austin stream near Bingham, Maine? No. No, I don't know anything about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and you Catherine can probably Perkins. Go to the, you could probably go to the Bingham Historical Society and get that information. Yes, that's it. That's actually a really good, a really good tip. Um, do, can you say anything more about narrow gauge railroads? Well, again, they, the reason they built them was they were more cost efficient. Uh, they built them just to get from point A to point B. Uh, again, at one time, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Bangor, Maine, at one time, had 300 sawmills. Think about this, 300 sawmills. They also had 111 brothels and barns. So I think it was kind of a wild town for a while. But So they had to find a way to get the, the, uh, the pulp and the logs to the mills to saw, and then they had to find a way to get the, the uh, lumber to the port to ship it out of Bangor down the Penobscot River. So uh, they were very, very significant. And, and I, I'm, I'm really fond of the narrow gauge. I think it's, uh, it's fun to see, which is why I think the Wiscass at Waterville and Farmington's a perfect family outing during this COVID thing to go up there and take a train ride. I gave a talk up there on the train a couple of weeks ago and it was quite a hit. And on the back of my book, you'll see a train wreck, a train accident. And that photo is taken at its Mason's wreck, which was where the Waterville and Wiscasset Farmington Railroad went up the road a ways and they train went off the tracks. And the reason they call it the Mason's wreck was the Masons uh, used to go by that train and go to their meetings. And the wreck happened, so every year now they have a picnic and they go up on the train and where they had the wreck and have a picnic. And it was kind of neat because we went up there and, and they stopped there and that's where I gave my talk. And they had a picnic and it was really a great time. We had 70 or 80 people that came. It was a good time for the families to go up there and social distance and be able to, to have a good train ride. But it's, uh, we had the narrow gauge railroads. Again, you, you, you know about the Sandy River and Ranger Lakes. A lot of the railroads up there were narrow gauge. You had the narrow gauges that were going up into to the mining areas and out to the western part of, of Maine. And you had the narrow gauge in the counties. But again, it was a way for the mill owners and the mine owners uh, to get the product a short distance to where it was going. There's a great book that's called Two Foot of Totogus. And uh, that's it's worth picking up. And the, Two foot of the one to Tobis is kind of interesting because that's the only narrow gauge railroad in Maine that didn't connect with any other railroad. The uh, veterans that were going up to the veterans home in, in uh, Togus would come by ferry and get off and uh, across from uh, Gardner, get on that train and go to Togus. And they also got all their coal delivered that way. They bring it up on barges and put it on there. And until they built the trolleys and the trains out of Augusta, that was a very, very, very busy railroad. But that's a very, it's written by Robert Jones, I believe it is, but it's a, there's a reference in my book that you can see, but that's a, a great book to pick up that talks about not only the, the veterans home up in Togus, but it also talks about the, uh, it's a great example of a narrow gauge short line railroad. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, so much. Um, for, for joining us this evening, for this program, for sharing your expertise. People have shown a lot of interest in the book in our store. 
Um, so uh, congratulations on this, your, your first publication. I think it's doing well. And uh, folks in the chat have just been really enthusiastic with their questions and sort of talking with each other about what they know and resources they would point each other to. So thank you so much, everyone, for participating in the program this evening. Just a couple reminders to learn more about Maine Historical Society, our upcoming programs, how to become a member. You can visit us at mainhistory.org. To purchase your copy of uh, The History of Maine Railroads by Bill Kenny, you can visit our online store at mainhistorystore.com. And if you want to learn more about this topic, more about Maine railroads, trolleys, see historical records, photographs, online exhibits, uh, sh or she even share your own main stories. If you've got your own main railroad story you'd like to share, uh, please visit Main Memory Network uh, at mainmemory.net. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Bill, uh, for your time and for that presentation. Is there anything uh, else that you'd like to add before we close? No, except my wife and I are writing a new book. So next spring, you're going to have a book on historic taverns and tea rooms. Oh, awesome. That sounds Maine. great. Yeah, that'll be kind of different. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one already. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I hope that we'll see you all back here for another virtual program soon. Thanks.